Good afternoon. I'm Steve Snyder, as son and brother to Tim. I appreciate you all being here to do honor to us and to the family and to Dad. Dad was a member here for a relatively short time and didn't make many friends. But I think he would be surprised at the turnout today. He always loved an audience and he loved to make speeches. And I am convinced that if he could have worked out a deal with the Lord, he would be standing here today instead of me. Well, Dad, the uh, Lord doesn't quite work that way, so you're stuck with Beth has written a wonderful biography of Dad. It's in your bulletin. I hope you get a chance to read about this remarkable life. It details the facts about the man. So I would like to speak about the nature of the man. Eulogizing a life of 96 years is impossible. If I were to have written down all my thoughts over the last month, we'd be here until dinner time. I won't do that. I lead morning prayer in my church four times a year when our vicar is absent and I write my own sermons. And when I'm having trouble with it, I remember the words my vicar told me. She said, what does it mean to you? And when I pray on that, I find the words to say. So here's what Dad meant to me. We never saw him cry. He never said, I love you. Now this might seem harsh, but let me explain. We knew he loved us, but he never said. Dad was a product of a very strict and Victorian upbringing where men don't cry and you only say I love you to your spouse. When his father died at the age of 15, he wasn't allowed to cry. He was told that death is a part of life and we must accept it when it comes. Never forget that you are the son of a Presbyterian minister. So he started to build that emotional wall around himself. To more, he threw himself into perfecting his photography. He also painstakingly painted the carved flowers and leaves on an old cabinet. As I grew up, that cabinet was in our basement and used to store paint. Today, it proudly stands in my house. It's used for holding phone books, cookbooks, and whatnots. And on his last visit to our house, Dad said, I always meant to finish that. When Mom died, he spent six weeks planning every word and song of her memorial service. It was a beautiful tribute to her. After that, he wrote a book detailing their life together and her demise. That's how he grieved. But we never saw him cry. When my daughter, Lindsay, survived a successful open heart surgery at the age of five, he expressed his joy by writing a mass, a small part of which is part of today's service. Music was Dad's second greatest love. It was part of his entire life. Growing up and seeing our house was filled with music. Family gatherings would include a session around the piano singing hymns and old tunes. Every Saturday afternoon we had to listen to live from the Metropolitan Opera, 
they frequently add would stay no more. While working in the basement when he had his business down there, he would sing arias and passages from operas in his beautiful baritone voice. It was, however, a bit embarrassing when I would bring friends over to play and Dad was singing at the top of his lungs. But my friends knew that that was Dad. He wrote music all the time. His greatest accomplishment was having his Easter cantata performed in this very sanctuary. I had never heard any of it before and was amazed that he could write something like that. I was so proud. Now, Dad sometimes had a skewed sense of priorities. For example, on a fishing trip to Canada, he wanted to take the perfect picture of our day's catch out on the dock. Unfortunately, he took one step too many backwards and fell into the water. He immediately raised his camera over the head and said, don't save me. Save the camera, which of course we immediately did, because we knew how important the cameras were. Oh, by the way, we saved Dad too. He had a dry, almost British sense of humor. He loved quotations and plays on words. At his 50th anniversary celebration, he of course had an audience, had to give a speech. He referred to his marriage as, oh, what a lovely war. <laughs> I can only imagine the words that mom had for him when she got home. His religious beliefs were practical and quite Episcopalian. He believed in the resurrection of the spirit, but not the body. This is because he once calculated the total number of people who ever lived and divided it by the available square footage of land and realized that we would all be packed together, shoulder to shoulder. He mused that not only would food be a problem, but waste management would be a nightmare. <laughs> it seemed that there was nothing he couldn't do once he put his mind to it. And for Tim and me, sometimes it was hard to grow up in that shadow. But over time, I learned that there were at least two things that he couldn't do, that I couldn't do. The first was dance. He may have had rhythm in his music, but it did not, it did not extend to his feet. He was a lousy dancer. And it's surprising that he and Mom never got together because she was a wonderful dancer. She could cut a rug and jitter bug like a pro. But then she couldn't sing. Secondly, Dad had a typical boyhood dream of becoming a locomotive engineer. It was like being an astronaut today. Well, the world's a better place that he did not become an engineer. It was my profession for nearly 24 years, and it came to me naturally. At the training club, I could run our engines for hours, and when I wanted to take a break, I would say to Dad, your dad would take it. There'd be a full head of steam, water in the boiler, and a good fire. Dad would take the train around one mile of track, and when he would come back, there would be no steam, no water in the boiler, and the fire would be almost out. He'd get off disgustedly and say, I don't know what's wrong with this thing, you take it. Our train relationship became symbiotic. I run 